Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Okay. I'm sure everybody has a syllabus. Silly bus. Uh huh. This is an old one, but I thought it was cute. A nun's car ran out of gas. At a gas station nearby, she asked the attendant if she could borrow a can with enough gas to start the car to drive it over. He said he didn't have an extra can, but luckily she found a bedpan in her car. She filled it up, went back to the car. As she poured the gas in, two men watched her. One said to the other, I know the Lord turned water into wine, but if that car starts, I'm going to church every Sunday the rest of my life. <laughs> uh, how many of you remember General Norman Schwarzkopf? I, Desert Storm, uh, I got privilege that when I was up in Canton, we went over and to Cleveland and listened to him speak, and uh, it was very enlightening. In an interview, General Norman Schwarzkopf was asked if he thought there was room for forgiveness toward the people who have harbored and abetted the terrorists who perpetrated the 9-11 attacks on America. His answer was classic Schwarzkopf. The general said, I believe that forgiving them is God's function. Our job is to arrange the meeting. I thought that was good. And then for the preacher boys, three boys are in school, in the schoolyard bragging about their fathers. The first boy says, my dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper. He calls it a poem, and they give him $50. The second boy says, that's nothing. My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper. He calls it a song. They give him $100. The third boy says, I got you both beat. My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper. He calls it a sermon, and it takes eight people to collect all the money. <laughs> and the last one, a husband looking through paper came up on a study that said women use more words than men. Excited to prove to his wife that he had been right all along when he accused her of talking too much. He showed her the study results. It read, men use 15,000 words per day, but women use 30,000. The wife thought for a while, then finally she said to her husband, it's because we have to repeat everything we say. The husband said, what? <laughs> so I was trying to be nice to you girls. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning verse 19. Paul has been explaining that God had not sent him to baptize but to preach the gospel that Christ had revealed to him. Remember Christ personally returned and personally gave Paul further revelation, further uh, scripture as so he could write his 13 epistles. And so uh, that's what he's talking about. Then he teaches we are not to preach the gospel with wisdom of words. This was human logic and opinion of human thinking. By doing this, it removes the word, its message, as the final authority with human viewpoint. You know, somebody said, boy, they can really persuade a person. Well, you have to be careful about using your talent than using the message itself. You have to be careful with that. No, one of the main reasons the majority of people will not embrace rightly dividing is that they have embraced human viewpoints over the final authority of Scripture. That is why they do not see the mystery, the mystery program. 
They have not established, nevertheless, at thy word. Remember the story when they were out fishing, they had caught nothing, and Jesus said, throw your nets on the right side over here. He said, we've been fishing all night and everything, you know, but then they backed off and they said, nevertheless, at thy word. And that's a good thing for all of us to learn. You know, we need to be open, and whatever the word of God teaches us, we should embrace that. Okay, regardless of denomination, of tradition, we trust what God says in his word. Amen? Our desire is to see you involved in learning and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. That is our passion, but before that can happen, you, have, you must have settled established in your heart that God's word is the final authority. And I don't know how many times uh, when I was at Temple and we listened to guys and the teacher explaining the word of God in, in a number of ways and uh, students were always questioning instead of just believing what the word says, always questioning, always questioning. And that's people today too. When man's viewpoint and ideals control the church, people will not see or understand not only the mystery program, but also not the pure cross work. Man will trust in men's words and not the word's truth about the cross. This takes away faith in the cross's power to save on its own and denies God's word in what it says. Man seemingly always has to give his opinion attached to the gospel. And uh, then it ceases to be grace. Huh? When you begin to add and continue to add to the gospel. Evidently, we don't think it's powerful enough on its own to get the job done. And, of course, that's not true. Verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolishness the wisdom of this world? There are only two groups in the world, those that perish and those which are saved, saved or the lost. Their spiritual position and growth will determine their evaluation of the cross. You know, when you're a young believer, or if you're lost, you make excuses for the cross and about the cross being sufficient. To save one totally, completely. And uh, we don't, sometimes even as Christians, we don't see that until you get into the teaching of the cross and what it actually accomplished. And when you find out what it truly accomplished, you don't rely on anything else. You just rely on that cross. The wisdom of this world is foolishness, atheism, socialism that's becoming popular in our country openly nobody criticizes it humanism evolution and you can read those verses but look at Romans 121 there because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations they begin to exclude God and their foolish heart they're fools for doing that, was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, our country, they became fools. Our country is foolish because they're excluding God. You can hardly mention the name God just about anywhere anymore because you don't want to, uh, they don't want you to offend anybody. It's not politically correct. And uh, on and on it goes. It's crazy what's going on right now. 
it is time we believe the book, the Bible, is always right. Now I want to give you an example here. Proverbs 30. Surely the churning of milk bringeth forth butter. That's a fact. The wringing of the nose bringeth forth flood, or forth blood. So, wives, what I want you to do, I want you to put your two fingers over your husband's nose, and I want you to go like that real hard. And we're going to see if blood doesn't come. That be fair? <laughs> it's a truthful fact. It happens. <laughs> God has and will destroy man's wisdom. Isaiah, just where it's underlined, for the wisdom of their wise shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. God is telling Israel in the tribulation, that's over here, we're raptured out and the tribulation begins, that they did not think God could do what he was telling them. You do not think, he says, I can do what I said I would do. You have your ideas and opinions of what I can do. But when I do what I said I would, I'm going to destroy the wisdom of the wise and man's contrary opinion to my word. I remember working construction for 15 years. And uh, before I ever went to school to go to the ministry, and uh, boy, they had opinions. They thought they were really wise. And uh, I, I thank God for the opportunity, the privilege that I've had to have a couple of their funerals and to be able to preach the gospel at their funerals. And it's interesting how God works that out sometimes. And the only hope they had is if they put their faith in the, in the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Remember, Satan's, yea, hath God said? The first thing he did was to challenge God's authority of his word. So God says in verse 20, where is the wise? This is the philosopher, lover of wisdom. This is the Greek in verse 22. Then where is the scribe? That is the Jew, expert in law, who wrote out the word and then taught it. Where is the disputer of this world? Paul asks, where is the debater, the controversial reasoner, the one who wants to stand up and argue their human viewpoint with God? And there's a lot of those people today, they go on speaking tours, huh? and uh, even presidents, <laughs> and uh, they go on these speaking tours to show how much they know and their wisdom and everything. God has already made man's wisdom as foolish. How does he do that? The next verse for after that, the, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. In the wisdom of God, he did not allow the world to discover him by its wisdom. Now, this was interesting to me. But it pleased him to allow the world to know him through the foolishness of of preaching to save them that believe. Man thought this to be too simple, foolish. You believe in Christ? Ah, they're one of those fools again. God wants man's encounter with him to be supernatural, spiritually, spiritually illuminating, and on his terms. Men are not saved by what they know, but by whom they believe. Isn't that good? Well, I thought it was good. <laughs> the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 
having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is, in the, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And then verse 6, if you would. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, it has to be a God thing. It's not a man thing. Well, I've studied this, I've studied this, and I've come to the conclusion this. No, it's not about that. It's about when God reveals to us how rotten sinners we truly are, but also shows us the remedy for our sin, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 22 for the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after salvation. The Jews wanted to see a demonstration of power before they would believe. The preaching of the cross embarrassed them, the Jews, since they were the ones who consented to Christ's crucifixion. They didn't like it. They were the ones let his blood be up on us. They wanted him dead. Remember that even Moses had to perform signs before the enslaved Jews would accept him as their leader. You can read that in Exodus. Notice A. This is a very important verse showing the Jews to always want signs shown to them in order to believe. Remember, and I think it's a fellow's up in the booth there. Uh, Mark chapter 16, uh, verse 20, I think. Mark 16, verse 20. And uh, he said, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following them. How do we know you're from God? In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. He gave them signs so that the other Jews, when they would preach their kingdom gospel, they would believe. This fact should not surprise us. For 1,800 years, God had confirmed his word to them with signs. Signs were an important part of Jesus' kingdom ministry to Israel. And boy, did he show signs, by the way. It started off with Moses. Can you imagine all the plagues that coming in on Egypt? They saw. They should have just, right then, just said, never less at thy word, we're going to trust you. Matthew 10, notice verse 8, Jesus commands them, Go into the house of Israel, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. So they had power to be able to perform the miraculous as a sign in order to get the people to believe the message that they were speaking to them. In early Acts, chapter 2 through 7, after the gospel of the kingdom had been offered, presented to the Jews, and the Messiahship of Jesus had been confirmed, but rejected by them. You remember they stoned Stephen, right? And that was the nation's last opportunity at that time. As a nation, God would set them aside for a time. But as a nation, they rejected Stephen, full of the Holy Ghost, and stoned him to death. We need to recognize that the sign gifts, did I do that right? God put Israel temporarily aside with her sign gifts. We need to recognize that the sign gifts primarily related to Israel and not the church. When Israel was laid aside, they, the sign gifts, ceased. And that was Ernest Campbell. 
Now, Paul performed some because he was an apostle, but nothing like that was going on when the message was to the nation of Israel. Then the Greeks were constantly seeking not signs, but wisdom. They wanted rational proof before they would accept. Remember some of the Greeks mocked Paul when he preached the resurrection, when he preached the supernatural. They want wisdom. They laughed at the supernatural, just like today. They laugh at the supernatural, don't they? Because he hath appointed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man, Christ, whom he had ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him, Christ, from the dead. And when they, the Greeks, heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. <laughs> Shook some of them up. You ever tell somebody you just got saved? Huh? And they start laughing, they start mocking, or they start arguing, or they're mad at you because it convicted them, didn't it? Verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks, foolishness. In response to the Jews and Greeks' excuses, Paul did not allow that to stop him from proclaiming the cross. Paul did not show many signs, miracles to the Jews, nor did he hardly ever discuss rational proofs to the Greeks. His message contained what men needed, not what they wanted. Amen? You know, that's why the Lord said, preach the word, be in season, instant in season, out of season. You're going to have some people that are going to say, oh, this is good. Then you're going to have some other people, this guy's nuts. You're just going to have that. Now notice, Christ crucified was a stumbling block, an offense, a scandal to them. And I just wrote above them, Jews. To think that Jesus, whom they rejected and helped to crucify, was their very own Messiah. Whereas the Gentiles, the Greeks, regarded Christ crucified as foolishness, as they laughed. They would say, he could not save himself, how could he save others? How could he not save them by his life? How could he save them by his death? Or how could he not save them by his life? How could he save them by his death? To them, the cross was weakness. It's a weak thing. He didn't have enough power to save himself. If he had been who you say he was, he would have come down from that cross. You remember the Pharisees standing there? They said, come down. You think you're so hot? Remember Paul's message cons consisted of two parts. One was the gospel of salvation. Christ's substitutionary sacrifice is the only way of salvation. And you can look at those verses. Two, the gospel of the mystery revealed by Christ to Paul. Notice our verse on our walls. Who will have all men to be saved, salvation, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The knowledge of the truth is what's for the body of Christ today. Paul's epistles. That's what's for today. E, verse 24 but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul has divided humans into three groups. The Jews, the Gentiles, and those called. Jews and Gentiles saved. Those called are those synonymous with those saved. Believing ones, as verse 18 says. 
For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom, its own wisdom, knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And you can look at those verses there about being called. Number two. This is all understood through faith. Now those who believe in the gospel understand Christ's sacrifice, death, and his resurrection as the real power and wisdom of God. We now marvel at God's greatness and simplistic solution to man's problem of sin. Do you know that all man has to do to be saved today is believe? How, how much more simple can you get than that? It's so simple, man doesn't want to trust that. They want to add something to it. Something that they can do to help God save them. God says, no, I've done everything. I've died for your sins. I shed my blood for your sins. They buried me. I rose again. I broke the chain of death for man. I can give you everlasting life if you believe that gospel is enough to save you. Just believe what's already been done. I mean, that's it. Nothing else needed. And man says, too simple. <laughs> oh, the depth and riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. It mentions God's foolishness, the simplicity of the gospel, and his weakness, his purpose, plan, and love of the foolish. Of course... He is speaking from the unbeliever's point of view. The very part unbelievers think is ridiculous is truthfully God's greatest wisdom, the cross and Christ crucified. Paul is saying that even if God possessed foolishness, he does not, God is not foolish. It would be wiser than man's greatest wisdom. And if God had any weakness, he does not, it would be stronger than man's greatest strength. So don't take it out of context. God has weakness. For you see your calling and brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Paul asked the many prideful, prideful of Corinth, to stop and look at themselves. Paul wanted them to observe and consider their calling and those included in it. They were to remember their past and then consider their present. B.C. before Christ, A.C. after Christ. Just look at your life. What you were before you were saved. Then how God saved you and where you are now. Take an evaluation here. That's what he's saying. If honest, they would find few wise intellectuals according to the flesh. There are not many of a great number of persons of rank, mighty, authority, or civil authorities. It seems that those who respond to God's call are servants and ministers rather than involved in the political world. They desire to get the gospel out. Second Timothy, no man that warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life 
that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. <laughs> now he mentions here noble. Noble are those born superior because of their family's position in life from a higher class of society. Not many. Regardless of one's position in life, God did not major in calling nobility and society's leaders to salvation. Not many, but only a few. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Isn't that interesting? Think, Dr. Stam says, if the wise, mighty, and noble had a monopoly on salvation, how little glory would go to God. <laughs> Isn't that true? But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to be brought to not things that are. You say, what in the world? But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. In society's eye, God has saved the inferior, the uneducated, the gullible, the silly, the weak, the geeks, and the less intelligent people of the world. But God's choices are often opposite of how the world would pick one. God's choices confuse the world. They are perplexed and even ashamed of us. God chooses the foolish to put to shame those esteeming themselves wise. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I don't know how many times throughout the years I've heard, boy, they have so much talent. <clears throat> boy, if God could ever get a hold of them, they could really do something for God. Well, what would you trust in their talent or the power of God in their life? Huh? There's a reason God chooses the foolish and the less in society. He says, too, the weak things to confound the things which are mighty. The mighty are stunned at us who are seemingly weak individuals, at how strong our life is. And we did not go through one of their programs. <laughs> what a blessing. If I had to go through their programs, I would have to back up. I couldn't tell if I was a boy or a girl. And if I was a girl, I'm not supposed to be a pastor, so I... We went from sinner to saint, from being the most unlikely people to succeed. But we in grace have been transformed, changed into vessels of honor who stand for Christ's ways. <laughs> Base things. I qualify here. Among others, this is those of us who come from a low life, not refined, born on the wrong side of the tracks. We experienced a poor hand, at times a difficult life. 
we had few material things. The successful-minded elitists are baffled. They say, why them? They are the ones who seemingly have the answers to life's fulfillment. When looking at us in our contentment in Christ, they think, how could that be? They're stunned at us. They're stunned that we have somewhat of a settled, established life behavior. I remember Carol's 25th anniversary of her graduation at Manuel, and a lot of people in Manuel, uh, Emmanuel went to Manuel, <laughs> and uh, we went to the graduation thing there. And uh, before it started, one of my old friends came up. He said, Jim and Dick. He said, how to H are you? I said, I'm fine. He said, what are you doing now? I said, well, I'm a pastor. And he stopped. <laughs> and he looked at me. He said, well, that's good. And he walked away real fast. <laughs> Stunned. <laughs> but I got the, the guy came up and he said uh, would you say the convocation is I guess that's how you say it and I got the leading prayer isn't that amazing how God works sometimes huh and in our prayer I was very gracious in what I said and everything but I still mentioned that Christ died for our sins and so on what an opportunity are despised. These are those who are beholding to others, dependent upon others to make it in life. They are looked down upon by most. These are the people that the world writes off. Perhaps they have been soiled by sin, divorced, a different color, addicted to alcohol, drugs, or immorality. Often these types of people are rejected, isolated, frowned upon, less desirable, and even forgotten. Then he says, which are not to bring to naught things that are. These are those who are never, ever considered by the world. They are continually overlooked. So God moves up on the most unlikely people. This stuns the world because believers are the ones who have peace, strength, and a behavior that influences others. We live from a BIB biblical viewpoint and do not cave in to human wisdom. Faith produces. If you have faith in God, faith in his word, and you trust it and try to follow it, it will produce in your life character, strength, wisdom, biblical wisdom. It's amazing. And then the last verses, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are you in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Boy, Paul's taken on the elite of Corinth. He's the leaders and all of them. He's trying to say, you know something? You're not really very much. <laughs> Uh, Paul, he, he's amazing. And I know he's under inspiration, but it's amazing how God used him. He had a way of just <laughs> getting into him, didn't he? This shows the reason God does this. God will not share his glory with any human being or angelic host. He is showing that man's wisdom that excludes God is never glorified by God. 
Man's wisdom has only left mankind lifeless, empty, and in desperate need of God's grace. And our country is in desperate need right now. He is showing here that salvation is not based upon man's ability, accomplishments, fame, fortune, status, or wisdom. Man has nothing of his own to contribute to his salvation or reason God should call him. Why? That God always is to receive all the glory. Amen? And I think that's good that God saves uh, a number of different types of people that we can be able to relate to all types of people. And uh, he gets the glory. We know it wasn't us. It's God, if anything good is accomplished. And he gets the glory. Here is who we truly were to who we are today, if saved. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not Inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor infeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. God says, them, no way. And such were some of you. That's what you used to be. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our Lord. You're a different person now. God saved you from all that trash. I had a lot of trash in my life. How about you? Some of you did and some of you don't. Didn't maybe as much. But I'm so grateful for the grace of God and People might bring up my past. That just gives me an opportunity to say, well, you know, that's the way I used to be, but I'm not that way anymore. Uh, God's done a work in my life. He saved me, forgave me all my sins, gave me eternal life, and he's changed my life. I no longer seek those things. Now I, I seek those things which are above. <laughs> and so that gives us an opportunity to give God glory for doing something supernaturally. And as I was going through this uh, study, I, was, I found it fascinating how God deliberately doesn't call very many mighty, noble authority of society and the big leaders and big wigs. He just chooses the average common person. And, uh, and he does that for a purpose. He takes a few of those but the majority is just the ordinary person. And uh, you remember when Christ was on earth and the Pharisees were always at him, always at him. But it says, but the common people heard him gladly. Because it's the common people that are fighting life's difficulties that when they hear how God has answered uh, or given a solution to them for their circumstances, not only of their sin, but of their life, common people will hear that gladly. Amen? Amen. Okay, anybody have a question before we take off here? Okay, we're just, 